Hello there, this is James S. Croft from the Universe 1978, and rounding off this mini-series of reviews that ideally should have been made back around Halloween, I've been commissioned to review Ma, the 2019 film co-written and directed by Tate Taylor, which the person who paid me to review it condemns as stupid because, quote, the plot was all over the place and Ma's motivations change from moment to moment. But on the contrary, though, the irrational extremes of Sue Ann, a.k.a. Mars' motivation and behaviour, make perfect sense if you understand the ambivalence of her trauma-induced obsession. To begin at the beginning, though, the ostensible protagonist, Maggie, is a lonely girl whose divorced mother has moved them back to the small town where she grew up, and who soon meets and is befriended by a gang of kids who, because there's nothing else for them to do in the area, drive around vaping pot and trying to get adults to buy alcohol for them. Of course, most adults say no, but one woman agrees, and arguing that it's better, or at the very least safer for them to do so under adult supervision, offers to let them drink and get stoned in her basement where she can hold on to the keys and make sure that the designated driver is sober before she gives them back. Before long, in fact, she's hosting parties for other high school kids in her newly fitted out basement because she loves the attention, but as time goes on though, Sue Ann's behaviour becomes increasingly obsessive and even threatening, and as the story unfolds, we learn why. Back in high school, beyond merely being the outcast or the lonely bullied nerd, she was violated and humiliated by the popular clique in what they would describe as a prank, in the same sense that date rape is often dismissed as simply going a bit too far, but still nevertheless emotionally scarred her for life. Meaning that even now, more than two decades later, she is still obsessed with what happened to her, on the one hand desperate to be accepted as one of the cool kids, and even still having deep feelings for the high school crush who crushed her, but on the other, filled with homicidal rage and the burning desire for revenge. Like most, if not all, people who display similar behaviour patterns, however, Ma is ultimately obsessed with fulfilling two key needs and desires, First of all, finding a way to ease the pain and satisfy the rage that she feels, and secondly, to maintain total, absolute control. After her husband walked out on her, feeling terrified that her daughter would do the same, and therefore making her a prisoner in her own house, and to some extent in her own body, convincing the girl that she was sick and using drugs that she steals from the veterinary clinic where she works to make her so. Indeed, when you understand that Mars' behaviour is all part of her futile struggle to make the pain go away and to feel secure and in control again, the plot not only makes perfect sense, but flows seamlessly and is genuinely compelling. At first, throwing parties for high school kids to try and reclaim the wonder years that she feels were stolen from her. When that fails, stealing jewellery from the girls who come to her parties in the futile hope that having what they have will make her more like them. And then over time, as each coping mechanism fails and the rage grows within her, becoming increasingly violent and dangerous, with the defining scene of the film for me being when, after having the flashback in which it's revealed what they actually did to her, in that moment, reliving the pain as she drives along an isolated road in her pickup truck, she sees the now adult woman who went to the same high school and organised the prank that ruined her life jogging along on the other side of the road, and at the last second, she suddenly swerves to run her down, with the flashback thus flowing seamlessly into the movie and demonstrating that far from merely being another narrative device, it was indeed a flashback in the PTSD sense of the term. Although I feel that it could and indeed should have been explored much more deeply but was probably cut to save time, what's that? A Blumhouse film actually cutting scenes for once instead of simply padding out the story? Ma's ambivalent relationship with the ostensible protagonist Maggie was also deeply enthralling, simultaneously identifying, pitying and wanting to protect the girl, but also burning with envy at the fact that she was able to find friends and become the girlfriend of the most handsome boy in school so easily, and to top it all off, also wanting to punish her mother for being the coward who could have stopped the prank but chose not to. Alas, this being the only real hole in the film that I I can see, with that part of the backstory having also apparently either been deleted during the rewrites or left on the cutting room floor. 
To quote Angel in the episode, I Fall to Pieces, it's not about Melissa, it's about rage. This guy is too messed up to deal with a real woman and he can't stand that, so he creates a fantasy about a girl he barely knows, but eventually even she fails him, so he has to hurt her, because when he looks at her, all he can see is how useless he is, how damaged... But although I could spend the next hour analysing and praising almost every aspect of this movie, such as the fact that there's a literal Chekhov's pistol that is incredibly well utilised, and that when Ma is posing with the drunk Scooby gang like mannequins near the end to take the perfect high school photo that she always wanted, she paints the token black character's face white because, sorry, they only have room for one, thus saying more about race and racism in that single moment that is otherwise entirely irrelevant to the story than Jordan Peele did in the entire film, the sole purpose of which was supposedly to tackle the issue of racism in America. The bottom line is that in accordance with the principle that if you shotgun enough paint cans, then sooner or later you'll get a Picasso, either by some miracle or some fortunate failure on his part, at long last, Jason Blum has actually managed to produce a genuinely good film. Not a great film by any stretch of the imagination, but a solid 8 using the ranking system that I've ripped off from Jello Apocalypse, meaning that I recommend it to others, and if someone else invited me to watch it with them, then I would almost certainly enjoy doing so. A character-driven and narrative-led psychological horror that isn't riddled with plot holes, feeling like two or more stories that have been inexpertly mashed together, or a short film being dragged out into a full feature. A movie in which nothing is crowbarred simply to look good in the trailer, but that instead explores the depths of obsession and emotional trauma, showing those of us who were bullied or otherwise traumatised as teenagers, while at the same time feeling desperate to fit in, and beyond us as well, those people who longed to be loved by those who they hated for not loving them, that there for the grace of God go us all.'